Welcome or welcome back to Robe Trotting. I'm Derek, this is Mike, and we are Americans living in Denmark since 2017. And today we're gonna to talk to you about 10 different Danish words that we think any language should adopt, specifically English, our, our mother tongue. Yeah, so we're gonna start with one of my favorite words, which is kvajabaya, which literally means mess up beer or apology beer. This is great because in Denmark, beer fixes almost anything. I mean, any social situation, it's a little bit awkward put a beer into it and everything gets better. So it's kind of the perfect Danish term for what you do when you kind of mess up on something or maybe you slightly annoy somebody. You just need to make it up in a simple way. You give them a beer, a kvaya buyer. Yeah, it's basically like a uh, kvaya, I think, translates to or could be thought of as a screw up or a mistake, uh, something that you messed up and you need to fix. So you can fix it with a beer. Another Danish way to fix things is with a cake. Uh, we've talked about this on our channel before, but there's a lot of cake in Denmark, and you could also fix it with a kvajake. Uh, that also may be a more professional way. So if you do screw something up at work and you fall short in your tasks or something, or maybe your colleagues are just helping you out and picking up your slack because you've had a kvaya or a mistake, bring in a kvajake and uh, bring in a cake to show that you fix your mistakes. The next one is a really cute word called smurfispak, and it's kind of thing where you flick somebody. Normally you would flick them like in the middle of the forehead, uh, at least from what I've heard, and it's really cute when you know what it means. So it's actually a compound word combining smurf and kick. So the idea that you would smurf kick somebody in the middle of the forehead, it's really funny even though it's probably very annoying. Yeah, even though we didn't grow up in Denmark, I kind of wish we had this word to describe all the times I annoyed my little brother by doing this to him in the forehead and having him scream off to mom. Uh, sorry, Dan, for, for that, by the way. But it would have been a lot more cute if I could just go to mom and say, no, it was just a smurf, uh, smurf spark. It was just a smurf kick. Just a smurf kick. It's a smurf kick. What's he, what's he complaining about? He should stop crying. So now that we're adults and we're not smurf kicking each other anymore, comes one of my favorite Danish phrases, which is... Little Friday, Little Friday, which is an amazing term that justifies any opportunity you have to take some drinks with your friends during the week. So it's typically used for drinks on a Thursday after work. I remember when we were pretty early here in Denmark and our friends were like, oh, let's have a Little Friday down in the harbor. And we were like, wait, we know enough Danish to know that means Little Friday. It's Thursday, right? And that's what it is. It's just an excuse to go for drinks on a Thursday and be able to just enjoy a nice, you know, any chance you had to drink on a weeknight. Right, like you still have school or work the next day, but it makes it feel like it's a Friday. It's just a little Friday, though, <laughs> right? It's just a nice way of justifying that midweek drink or Thursday night drink. And we used to say something in American English, at least, we would call it like Thirsty Thursday, but I just think that that sounds so trashy it when does. you can actually say it in a much more elegant and sophisticated Danish word like Lilfriede. You know, try incorporating that into your, uh, you know, English uh, with your American colleagues and friends. We're going to go just for a little free day. A little free day. You'll sound really classy, maybe a touch pretentious, but it's okay. It's, it's European. European. It's Danish. Exactly. It's Scandinavian. Yeah, it's acceptable. And as a bonus, another word. Now, this is Swedish and Norwegian, but they have the same concept, and it's Lil Lode, or Little Saturday, and they typically do this on a Wednesday. Now, I know it's a bit confusing. I think for them, it actually derives from the fact that servants used to have a Wednesday off because they had to work during the week. At least that's what I, I, I read or I heard somewhere. So, I don't know. If you're Swedish or Norwegian, let us know the origin if you know it. The next word that we think belongs in other languages, especially English, is... Tilt optimist. Uh, basically, it translates to time optimist. And I think everybody knows somebody like this. It's basically a person who thinks that, okay, maybe I'm like this. It's a person who is often late because they think that they have enough time to get everywhere and do all the things that they need to do in their day. And really, they don't. Yeah, this is describing you to a T. Sorry, but it's my whole it family. I come from a long line of time optimists. <laughs> so the classic case is when something you think is maybe twenty minutes away, and so you decide that you're going to leave at say twenty to eight when you have an event at eight o'clock, and really it's like thirty five minutes. This is all the time when we're going to places that literally aren't around the corner. Like if we're going to the the harbor to meet some friends, like oh it's only five minutes away. Yeah, it's five minutes by bike if you don't count having to walk into the courtyard, unlock the bike, walk across it everything else. It's just, it's just being a little bit optimistic on what we have to do. Another way you can think of the word is somebody who over-programs themselves. This is 
very common, I think, in rides kind of needed as an American term because going back home when we were in the States, you know, there'd be times in the weekend where we try to do three or four or five things on a Saturday. Oh, we're going to wake up, we're going to go to the gym, we're going to go to Home Depot, we're going to run some errands, we're going to do this, and we're going to go to somebody's house for some beers and go for a barbecue, and we're going to meet friends for dinner, and it's impossible to pack all that in. So I think there are many, many weekends that we were still optimists back in the States, and we didn't realize there was a word describing who we are. Yeah, it's now that I know it, I can just, and it sounds a lot more pleasant, kind of like some of these other words. It just seems excusable to say, no, I'm sorry I'm late all the time. I'm just a time optimist. <laughs> no, everybody loves an optimist, That's right? Good. Yeah. Now, you can also look at this word in the reverse, where you could have a time pessimist as well. And that's basically somebody who's like chronically early to things. They give themselves maybe an hour to, you know, get to, uh, you know, a, a, a train station where it really like they don't need an hour. They could have just waited a little bit longer and gotten there 10 minutes before their train, but they want to be there an hour before their train, just in case, because they're a time pessimist. They also may under-program themselves and kind of refuse or turn down invitations and events because they're worried that they won't have enough time for everything. So, I don't know. Most people, I guess, would want to fall in between, but I at least like that I have a word for it now. So one of the other things that we love about the Danish language is how honestly precise it is. I mean, it's the language that gives so you animals literal. that are completely literal, like obviously a bat is a flying mouse, but my favorite kind of term that we have with this is when it comes to family. So in English, one of the biggest challenges that you have is describing your grandparents. Okay, if you're talking about grandma, are you talking about your mom's mom or your dad's mom? In English, you just have grandma and you have to hope you get the right one, the right birthday card. But in Danish, you have a very precise way of saying it. You have more more, which is your mom's mother, and you have far more, which is your father's mother, and we keep going through the fars as well. And it's super nice to be able to have a very precise term for that grandparent you have. Now, obviously, there's also the term bestimo or bestifa for a grandfather or grandmother, if you want to be more kind of uh, broad in, in the term that you use. But I love that precision that Danish brings to our lovable grandparents. Yeah, when you hear somebody describe their grandparents or what they call their grandparents, at least in American English, it's all over the place. You have these wild card names like my mom has uh, my nephews call her Gigi. What does that even mean? I don't know. Where does it come from? I guess the G is for grandmother. Who knows? Some people call their grandmothers Mima or Nana or <laughs> I don't know, all kinds of different things. And the same can apply to what you call your grandparents. If it's grand or your grandfather, if it's grandpa or pop pop or or poppy, whatever, uh, it's all kinds of different names. And I really like that. Danish really simplifies yeah. that. So it made my life easier because I have two grandmas that both have the name Margaret. So I couldn't even say Grandma Margaret because it'd be <laughs> both of them. So yeah, Danish, well done yeah. with this. This is something that Chef's we should kiss. have. Now the next word is Fulsus porno. And I have to say, I made a bit of a mistake when I first saw this word in print. I quickly looked at it and thought that it was the root of another word in Danish, which is Fulsus Day. And it is not. Fusel's Day means birthday. So I looked at this together and thought that it was like birthday sex or something like that. And then somebody actually told me the meaning. Basically, Fusel's is uh, like feelings. So you're basically taking somebody's feelings and... Uh, well, porno, I'm not going to explain that, but you know, you know it when you see it. It's different for everybody, but I think we all know what it is. So when you put that together, like a feelings porno basically is when you kind of manipulate somebody through emotions in an almost shameless, like kind of tacky way. Yeah, there's an example that one of our followers on Instagram shared with us about after the September 11th tragedy that there was a company that was selling diamonds that was basically trying to make the expression that at least in tragedy that, that diamonds are forever. There's something to be cherished and handed down. And it's like, look, like everybody likes diamonds and we get their purpose, but like too soon. Yeah. And like you can offer condolences to the victims of 9-11, which I think they did in this advertisement, but then they tried to sell diamonds. Nothing wrong with selling diamonds, but maybe don't use a, a tragedy like 
September 11th to do that. Yeah, and this is one that I like too because you can see kind of like how we are trying to steal Danish words to bring into the American vernacular. This is a case where Danish is able to bring in more of a English term mm. like porno and kind of be able to use it to manipulate a certain word to show in this case a word about manipulation. So always fun how languages kind of come across each other to develop new things. And I'm sure somebody will mention it in the comments, but it should also be said that Denmark was the first country to legalize pornography. There so go. there you go. You even see it in the language. So our next one is one that actually we learned from a reader as well, or follower as well, that we'd never really heard before, and it's the word tells, which apparently is more of a use term coming from, from Jutland, which is referring to something that is kind of a, a slog or a drag or something like that that would be in American English how we would kind of describe it. Something that's kind of annoying that you have to do, but it's kind of just a, a, a drag, I think, is the best translation for it. Yeah, and uh, while it's just kind of the uh, the word for something that's mildly annoying or unpleasant, it actually has a bit of a darker origin, and it comes from a word that was used to describe enslaved people that were brought back from Viking raids, or it comes from an Old Norse word that described that and the types of things that they had to do that were a bit more than mildly unpleasant. But um, anyway, it's kind of been passed down and now it just means something that's kind of a drag or annoying. Now the next one we have is OSQ, which is kind of could be translated directly to overview. However, it's used a little bit differently. Uh, my understanding is that you're using it to say like the mental capacity or the mental bandwidth for something. So in essence, you could say something like, yeah, ik ha OSQ på det i dag, or I do not have the OSQ for that today. I don't have the mental bandwidth. I just can't, I cannot, I cannot cope, cannot deal with it. I can't fathom it. I can't imagine it. You get the point, right? Yeah. yeah fathom, I think, is the way that I would describe it best. It's just kind of something where it's like, can't you imagine can't it. even imagine it. Like it's just beyond, you could almost say. Mm -hmm. So something that's a little bit broader in that way. I think it's, it's a fun kind of word to be there to just say, yeah, yeah, I, of a good day. Like it's just, I just don't have it in me today. Just let's not even try it. I just not can't. today. Not today. So another of our favorite words that we've learned recently and have fallen in love with is the word tuna kicks, which literally means crying biscuit. So the idea with this one is it's the kind of thing, and this is kind of given in that wonderful Danish sarcasm. It's, mm. you know, in theory or literally, it's something that you're going to give to somebody if they're having a bad day, something is wrong, they're crying, and so you're going to give them a biscuit. Give your kid a cookie and better. shut them up. Shut yeah. them up. But really what it means is it's when you, somebody, like, it's, it's very sarcastic where it's where somebody, you know, you want to kind of be like, oh, kind of piss off a little bit. Like, it's just kind of like, yeah, take your crying biscuit and go, and go away with it. Especially because our understanding too is the word tur, uh, which is the root in there, which means cry. It's a very specific kind of crying. It's not just like boohoo crying. It's like obnoxious, over the top crying. So it's like, yeah. it, it's kind of that, that style in there where it's like, you're being obnoxious. Here's your biscuit. I think it also lends itself to the uh, to what we would say in English is toot. Like mm -hmm. it, <laughs> Same so root. You can imagine the sound of somebody crying that would also come from that root word in Norse. Um, now, I, I've also heard that uh, one example, actually, when we looked in the dictionary for this or the word book, which it would literally translate to in Danish, uh, is <laughs> was that somebody should give uh, the late Prin he Prince Henrik a uh, tool kicks uh, because he, if you don't know anything about him, he often was upset that his eldest son, Crown Prince uh, Frederick, outranked him and he didn't like that he wasn't able to have the title of King of Denmark because he was married into the royal family, right? So any of that drama he would whine and make a lot of noise about and people would say that he can go cry into his 600,000 krona a month salary and if that's not enough then somebody can give him a tool kicks. Uh, so there you have it. He can have a crying cookie. Another word that I really love is blintam. And this one especially means something to me because it is the word for appendix. And I'm not talking about the supplementary reading you would get, an appendix to uh, a book, for example. Uh, I'm talking about the unnecessary... Uh, part of your uh, anatomy that is, I think, was formerly attached to or is attached to most people's 
intestines, but not me because I had mine taken out when I was 12 years old and I was in the hospital for a month. It was really bad. Uh, so this one I'm very sensitive to, but I like that Danes have a word called blintarm so they can have a separate word for the body appendix. Now they do have the word appendix, uh, which could be applied to both just like in English, but I love that there's a separate word for the organ. Yeah, and this is another case of Danish being the most literal language in the entire world because it literally means blind gut or blind intestine. Tom is the word for the intestines or the, or the gut. And so it makes sense because this is kind of in the same way that you would have the word for, like, say, an alley. So the only one way in would be blind by. Blind by. So blind road. The same exact thing. Like, this is the blind part of your intestine because there's only one way in and it just kind of stands there. And it's it's kind like of, a dead end. It's like a dead end, and which it kind of is as it hangs from your intestine there. And it's just, it's funny as we were reading about this and learning all the different words for the part of the digestive system and realizing that everything is very literal so that you have the blintarm, which would be your appendix with the one way in, and then you have your endotarm, which is your rectum, where you have the end of the gut. Like it's, it's a very literal language, and that's why I, I love Danish again. Chef's kid for just being precise to the point and no fuss about it. Yeah, so we, we love these words and we enjoy getting to, uh, to, to share them here. And if you want to see more words that we love or more things that Danish people say, whether they're words or expressions that we love, you've got to watch this video right here. Let us know which one of these words you like the most and you will be adopting into your language in the comments below. And thanks for watching, everybody. Hi. Hi. Hi.